Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. And I have to thank everyone for being here on what a beautiful spring day. <laughs> so I appreciate it. And, and I appreciate you indulging me and in getting to talk about one of my favorite things, and that is marine microbes. And um, as you heard, I'm a microbial oceanographer, and I do study phytoplankton and how they interact with geochemical cycles. And we largely approach that using molecular level tools. So we're going to get down into a few weeds today in the molecular realm, um, and then hopefully come back out at the end. So the ocean makes our planet habitable. I don't think I need to tell anyone how important the ocean is, how beautiful it is, how awe-inspiring. And in fact, the ocean produces about 50% of global protein for the planet. And the ocean also acts as a critical buffer for CO2 in the atmosphere. So this is actually a plot where the warmer colors show increased anthropogenic carbon inventory in the ocean. And you can see all of this anthropogenic carbon that's been absorbed by the ocean. In fact, this modeling study showed that between 1800 and 1994, the ocean absorbed about 120 petagrams of carbon dioxide. And if you look at that, it's really an, the oceanic sink accounts for about 48% of all the fossil fuel emissions during that period. So about half of the fossil fuels that we burn have been absorbed by the ocean. And that's carrying with it uh, certain ramifications for both ocean chemistry and ocean life, which I'll talk about briefly at the end. So what do fish production and carbon cycling have to go with each other in the ocean? Well, you know, it's the microbes, of course, that unseen majority. That microbial population plays a critical role in ocean function, both as the base of the marine food web for fish production and in terms of carbon cycling. So I go out to sea a lot, and this is usually what it looks like. And even I have to stop and remind myself that there's an unseen world there and if you were just to take the smallest drop of water, a microliter from the ocean, and stain the microbes in it green here so you can image them, they look like stars in the sky. They're so numerous. So that little crystal on my colleague's finger there is one microliter of seawater. And those are all the bacteria that you see in one microliter of seawater. And you think about the size of the ocean, and that's pretty extraordinary. In fact, there are about 1,000 bacteria and about 10,000 viruses in every microliter of seawater. And that's wherever you go. Now, I actually study phytoplankton, which are a little bit larger than the guys that you see here. And they come in many different diverse shapes, sizes, and functions. Here are some images of the various phytoplankton that I work on. And just to orient you, the one up in the left is probably about five microns. And those colonies that you see on the right are maybe a millimeter or so. So these are all phytoplankton. And they have uh, one thing in common, that is they're photosynthetic. And they also have many differences and do different things. For example, these here highlighted are diatoms. They make a glass cell wall. That makes them heavy, and so they're very important in exporting carbon as they sink down to the ocean depths. Another personal favorite are the coccolithophores. Up there, you can see those sort of white, chalky plates. That's just what they are. They're chalk plates that that cell makes through a process called calcification. And in fact, the white cliffs of Dover are because uh, there's large blooms of coccolithophores making those little white plates in that region of the English Channel. Another personal favorite is this one that I've highlighted. These are actually colonies of a nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria called trichodesmium, which will make an appearance a little bit later on. So these phytoplankton serve diverse roles in the environment and in the ocean. And they're really important to microbial biogeochemistry. As I said, they're at the base of the marine food web, so they're like the plants of the ocean. They produce and consume greenhouse gases, and they account for roughly half of global primary production. So all the trees and grass that we think of photosynthesizing and being so important for the air that we breathe, that's only half of the total. 
And in fact, what I like to tell school groups is every other breath you take came from the ocean. My guys in the ocean, not the trees and plants. So here we have a cutaway figure of the food web and the carbon cycle just illustrating some of those points that I made. On the right, you can see that there's a certain amount of just general chemical exchange between CO2 in the atmosphere and CO2 in the ocean, but it's the phytoplankton that fix carbon dioxide that are involved in the biological pumping of carbon through either the food web where the, those phytoplankton get eaten in turn by fish, which then respire the CO2 back out into the atmosphere, or some of that carbon, especially if it ends up in things that are heavy, will actually be exported to the deep ocean where it can have long residence times of about a thousand years. Now, if we were to zoom back out again and think about the distribution of phytoplankton, we can actually watch and monitor them with satellites because they have chlorophyll pigments that we can detect from space. And so what I'm gonna show now is a movie that NASA put together showing wherever the worm colors are, phytoplankton abundance in the surface ocean. And one of the things that's striking about this, I think, and I love this movie. It's just watching the magnitude of what's happening, but also looking at where, for example, rivers with nutrients meet the ocean. You get real hot spots. You'll see the Gulf of Mexico come around. It's a real hot spot because of the Mississippi. So wherever you're fertilizing the water with nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, you get phytoplankton growth. Now we're coming around on the equator. You can see deep nutrient upwelling water and we're passing Hawaii. So phytoplankton carry out extraordinary roles in the ocean and are critically important. What, what's the time scale of the trees? Because they're really changing rapidly. Yeah, so that's an integration um, of a couple of years. So those are seasonal cycles that you're seeing. So it's a really exciting time to be involved in microbial oceanography because there's a, been a confluence of new technologies and approaches that we can bring to bear on questions that have been plaguing us that we haven't had the opportunity to really address before. And um, I've highlighted some of those here. So we've long struggled with the fact that our populations, at least for the phytoplankton, are relatively dilute. They're spread out all over the world. We have to go on a ship and take a sample. It's hard to do. There's also very few species-specific assays. So we can look at the bulk community, but we, if we want to really know what one of those special diatoms are doing or the nitrogen fixers, we need a new tool. And in fact, there historically have been very few genome-level resources for developing molecular tools. So the new opportunities and what makes it exciting now is that there's uh, been a confluence of both novel concentration and detection strategies. And I'm gonna make a shameless plug here to say, if you remember, you can ask me about how I'm using millions of children to analyze my data for me at the end of the talk. I don't have time to talk about it now. Um, there's also been increases in whole genome sequences and increases in transcriptomes and other tools that we need for de developing species-specific approaches. And in fact, what we largely are doing now is harnessing this molecular cascade that you see on the right of how a cell interacts with its environment. So you can imagine a cell, it's interacting with its environment, it senses and responds to that change in an environment in a matter of minutes in some cases. That will induce a transcription of genes into the transcriptome. Those are turned into proteins that then do the work for the cell and cause a change in activity or function. And by har harnessing different points in this biological cascade, we can develop species-specific tools to both ask and answer cells, what are you doing in your environment? How are you responding to changes? So the theme of harnessing that cascade will be throughout the rest of the talk. And I have to confess that I'm doing something a little bit different with this talk than I normally do, so you're going to be an, an experimental audience. And that is, instead of telling one big story, I'm telling you three vignettes today. Um, they all carry that same theme of what cells are doing with their environment. 
but I wanted to give you these little snippets so that you could get a better flavor for the kinds of things that we're doing. So the first vignette will be looking at coexisting in a sea of competition. So this is a story about diatoms and leveraging new transcriptome data that we have. The second vignette will be uh, called From Genome to Biome, and that will be looking at a nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria called Trichodesmium. And then at the end, really, it's more like future directions, so thinking about the future ocean and how phytoplankton may sense and respond to that. So the first vignette is about diatoms. And of course, diatoms, as I already highlighted, are critical to the carbon cycle and the ocean ecosystem. They have many closely related species, and that species diversity, that wealth of species, really increases productivity. Diatoms in the coastal zone are thought to account for almost 40% of marine carbon fixation. So they're half of the half of the total. They're a big deal. They have a silica cell wall, so literally a cell wall made of glass. And this makes them heavy, and they're thus really important for transporting that carbon down to the deep ocean, as well as fueling fisheries and the food web. They're found throughout the surface ocean, anywhere you go. And in fact, I have one picture here that was a tweet that we sent from the Antarctic expedition. No, it's not of penguins, although they were cute too. It's actually water from two different bays. The one on the left, you can see the iceberg water looks very blue. And the one on the right, it looks green. And it looks green because it is so full of diatoms, it's literally discoloring the water. So that kind of thing for me is literally as exciting as a penguin. It was pretty amazing. So the question here for this vignette is really how do resources drive phytoplankton distributions and activities, again, with a focus on diatoms. And I want to mention that this is part of the graduate work of one of my PhD students named Harriet Alexander. And we have a lot of real first order questions. We want to look at metabolic function. What kind of nutrients can they use? How are those pathways regulated? How are those pathways expressed in the environment? And are resources partitioned between different species in a way that allows them to compete or coexist? And these probably sound like really basic questions. And in some ways, they are. We just literally have not had the tools until about the last couple of years to be able to address some of these questions in this way. So we're leveraging metatranscriptome approaches to study these diatoms. And Historically, what we would have done is go out into the environment, isolate a diatom, get it into culture, and do experiments on it. And that's powerful, but cultures, even under your best effort, are never going to completely recapitulate the environment. And so by looking directly at field samples, you have the context of that organism already taken care of, it's interacting with its other, um, other species, for example. And um, we chose to look at transcriptomes as opposed to proteomes or the activities of the cell, even though those also have value, because the transcriptomes are species specific. They turn over really quickly. So these are very finely tuned responses for us to track in the environment. So this is a tale of two diatoms in Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island. Narragansett Bay is a highly productive estuary. It's very important in that region. The two diatoms are called Skeletonema and Thalassia syrorochula. And um, the questions that we were trying to ask with this study are, do closely related diatoms have the same expressed metabolic capacity? Is this metabolic profile consistent over time? And are the resource responses the same between species? Are they doing the same thing, or are they doing something different? And we took advantage of sampling at a time series station that's been in operation for almost 50 years, where they've been counting phytoplankton cells in Narragansett Bay. And so if we look over the 50-year record, these two diatoms actually have an interesting winner-loser dynamic. You can see that one will come up, and one will go down, and one will come up, and one will go down. And we have observed this for many years, but we literally don't know what's driving that. Is that competition over resources, or is it something else? And so we sought to address that. 
So we went out into Narragansett Bay and took samples. This is our very fancy laboratory setup. You can see it consists of a garbage bag and a table with some equipment on it. And so this summer we woke up at four in the morning and drove out to take these phytoplankton samples. So if Harriet looks groggy, that's because she got up really early. And we took the samples and put them through a pipeline. So the samples were collected, filtered. We also did an incubation, which I'll talk about in a minute. Then we isolate the RNA, we sequence it. For those of you interested in the details, we usually target 60 million paired end reads. And then we take those reads and we map them to a reference database. In this case, we're using a custom database populated largely by a program that the Moore Foundation ran to sequence transcriptomes for a number of different diatoms. So what does the data look like? Here's the taxonomic distribution of the reads. And you can see the different groups on the right. And Skeletonema and Thalassiosyra are along the bottom. So the most reads in the sample map to our two target species. And you can see there's a large increase in Skeletonema at that second time point. And in fact, if we look at the cell count record, we were super excited because we hit a bloom of skeletonema. So on the left, you can see skeletonema coming up and going down. And throughout that whole period, the Lassiosyra rotula was pretty low abundance. So with this tool, we not only have the ability to track who's there, but we can ask, what are they doing? What does their metabolism look like? And that's what I'm showing you in this figure here. So this is the expressed metabolic capacity of these two diatoms over time. And I realize you probably can't see the little categories very well. Those are different um, categories of metabolism. And in some ways, it doesn't really matter. You can get the whole point just by looking at the colors. And that is, if you look at the block on the left and you look at the block on the right, they don't look the same. So these two diatoms have very different expressed metabolic capacity. The other thing that you can see is if you look over time from left to right in one block, the colors change. And that's because the individual diatom is modulating its expressed metabolic capacity over time. So it's both plastic over time and there are unique responses between the two diatoms. So let's zoom in and look at that in a little bit more detail. Here's the cell dynamics on the top. And what you can see is the more red, the more transcripts are falling into that category of metabolism. And not unexpectedly, a lot of them are going into things like carbon metabolism or carbon fixation. That's because these are photosynthetic microbes. And you'll see areas where there's differential allocation. For example, Thalassiosyra rocha on the right that big red block at the bottom is glycan metabolism, and it's very different than what skeletonema is doing. We don't know what that's all about, but you can see that there's clear differences between these two diatoms. The other thing that's intriguing, if you look at the bottom, is that there appears to be a flip-flop in nitrogen and phosphorus <coughs> metabolism as well. Um, one last point I'll make about this figure, and that is the Sample two in the middle there, you can see the bloom sample for skeletonema also looks very different. S, S1 through S5, those are the sample time points. So this is over time during the course of a summer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we can actually delve in even further and look at specific genes and gene pathways. And that's what you see here. Um, just to orient you again, it's over time from left to right. And Thalassiosyra rochil is on the top and Skeletonema is on the bottom. And each of those little blocks represents the expressed signal for that sample. There are a few things that these diatoms have in common. For example, they have a urea cycle in the middle. But then there's areas where, again, you can see differences. So if we delve in, you can see on the right there is an am amino acid transporter. And it has a very high signal for Thalassiosyra rochula, not so much for the other one. And then if you look over here on the left, the nitrate pathway as well as the ammonia pathway, again, are different between the two organisms. 
That's similar also for phosphorus, where you can see um, one organism actually doesn't even carry a copy of the diesterase, and they have different phosphate transporters as well. So what this suggests is that these two diatoms have very different capacities to metabolize nutrients, and that, that's probably fundamental to those cells. Now, we have to be a little bit careful because a transcript doesn't always mean a change in the protein or the activity. But I feel pretty confident in extrapolating that way because we've done work with other diatoms, and this is an example just from a culture experiment comparing phosphorus replete to phosphorus stress cells. And you can see if you plot the proteome versus the transcriptome, there's very good choreography. So when we get a transcript turning on, we get the protein turning on, and in fact, if you look at the right, we even get the activity turning on. So these appear to be tightly linked. So when we're tracking transcripts, I feel reasonably confident in saying, I think this is actually what the cell's activity is experiencing. So moving on, we wanted to delve into this a little bit further and think, not just about those genes we could identify, but what are the resource responsive genes? And to identify those, we did some incubations when we were out in the field. So in some of the incubations, we added phosphorus, and in some, we added everything but phosphorus to try to drive them to the opposite extreme. We did the same thing for nitrogen. So the idea is make sure they're full of nitrogen and make sure they're nitrogen starved. And by capturing those two extremes, then, we can use statistical tools to look at how transcripts or genes are modulated over those two treatments and ask what changes in N versus plus N or minus P versus plus P. We can also go through and ask what doesn't change, what's stable, and then normalize all of the responders to the stable ones as a way of being able to compare across samples. This is conceptually the same as a technique called quantitative RT-PCR. It's just that we're doing it with a different kind of data. So here are the resource responsive genes. A couple points here. You'll notice the big gray circle up at the top, and that means most of the transcripts we can't identify. So we know they're there, we know they're unique, but we can't tell what they do. And that is very common for our field because we just have a uh, very poor understanding of a lot of the molecular underpinnings of these cells. But of what we can identify, the resource responsive sets, again, are different between the two diatoms. And we can go in and look at specific gene targets and how they're regulated across those incubations. And those are shown on the right. Just by way of a couple examples, there's a phosphate transporter that's upregulated under a low P for both of these cells. And um, there's actually an interesting story with nitrogen where there's opposite responses with the same target at the bottom. So just a couple more steps with all the data analysis. One of the reasons, now we could go through and we could plot the normalized counts and look at the distribution over time, but one of the challenges is, let's say Rochella has a signal of two and Skeletonema has a signal of two. I don't know if that transcript signal of two is the most Skeletonema has ever made or normally it makes a thousand and two is really low for that organism because we don't have any context for those signals. And so what we did is contextualize or proportionalize the signals based on the extremes in those incubations again. So basically say, we think the signals are going to be at their extremes in the incubation and normalize everything that way. So in this analysis, an STDN, for example, close to one would mean it's more low nitrogen-like. And closer to zero would mean it's more plus N-like. And so we can plot those signals over time in the, in the sample set across the bay. And you can see those signals on the right. And a couple things might jump out at you. One is that you're getting really high signals in S2 that suggests that skeletonema is more minus P-like. And you actually get the opposite in Rochella where the signal is more minus N-like. 
Now we have a nitrogen score and a phosphorus score for each target. So what we can do is plot them in a quadrant, one versus the other. So anything falling up in the left would be a high nitrogen, low phosphorus signal, and the opposite in the right. And we can ask, where do the resource responsive genes for these two organisms fall? Which quadrant do they go in? And what you might be able to see on the right for S2 is that there's a huge number of skeletonema genes that go in the low P quadrant. And then there's genes for Rotula that go in the minus N quadrant. So you have very different responses of these two different diatoms. So what I've done is just summarize all of that data in this plot here by adding up all of the targets in each quadrant and expressing it as a percent that's color coded. So the more red means the more targets went into that quadrant. And this is just a way of visualizing it. So what you might notice is if you look across what we call these flag plots, the colors are really different. In fact, they're almost opposite. And that's because we think we're seeing very finely tuned species-specific variation, and that each response, in fact, is significantly different from the other. And what's striking is that each response is typically orthogonal from the other. So what, what we think we're seeing are these two diatoms saying, we don't want to compete over the same resource. In fact, I'm going to do something totally different if given the opportunity. And it's probably what allows these two diatoms to coexist and not outcompete each other, and what drives that sort of boom-bust cycle that we see in the field. So to summarize this vignette, diatom metabolism is highly variable in this estuarine setting. It's uniquely expressed metabolic capacity, probably underpins that skeletonema bloom that we saw. And there seem to be trade-offs in nitrogen and phosphorus and that they don't all do the same things. And last, the pattern suggests that there's resource partitioning between these two organisms in the field, which is something that we've never had the tools to visualize before. We long suspected that this would likely be the case, but we haven't had the tools with which to assess it. Did you select the species at like random, or did you suspect ahead of time that they were? Well, so we had the long-term data set. And so we suspected that they would be good targets for this type of analysis. And then we purposefully made sure they were in the database. So we stacked the deck. Are, are these guys playing a, a stabilizing influence when they fluctuate, say, a, a CO2 condition? Well, all phytoplankton, to a certain extent, are um, influencing the extent to which CO2 is biologically pumped into the ocean. These two in particular, I mean, the estuaries tend to be very high in primary production, but that's, a, that's about all I could say about that. Is there any sense that one of these species exists and the other doesn't? Would you get the same um, I'm sure there is, yeah. They don't always co-occur. So that would be interesting to look at. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to our other vignette, and this is from genome to biome. And we're going to move into the realm of the nitrogen-fixing microbes. Nitrogen-fixing microbes play a really keystone or critical role in ocean ecosystems, and that's because nitrogen fixation is really critical to supporting primary production by other phytoplankton that can't fix nitrogen because nitrogen is typically very low in the ocean. You saw all those areas where rivers were introducing nitrogen and causing that red chlorophyll signal in that movie. You can imagine if you didn't have to rely on that riverine input and you could just fix your own nitrogen from the atmosphere, that would be a huge advantage. And you can imagine how critical those nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria are because they can fix carbon, they can fix nitrogen, and that new nitrogen that they bring into the system is called it's called new nitrogen, and it essentially feeds the phytoplankton nearby. Um, and in fact, in the North Atlantic, the organism we're gonna talk about, trichodesmium, um, may provide upwards of 50% of the new nitrogen when it's really active. So here's another kind of layout of basically what I just told you, but this time on the top, I actually have a picture 
of a concentration of trichodesmium that we took from a ship. So it's very buoyant and it's pigmented. So if the conditions are just right, it can float to the surface and discolor the water. We've only seen this a couple of times, but it's always exciting when you know they're there. Otherwise, you're just sampling water and you can't tell what's going on. Now, because trichodesmium can fix carbon and fix nitrogen, the two main things that we think of as important for limiting the activity of this microbe are iron, which typically comes in from dust deposition from the atmosphere, or phosphorus, which comes in from rivers. And I've really been fascinated by phosphorus for a long time and spent a lot of time studying how this organism uses phosphorus and whether or not it's getting enough phosphorus in the environment. So it's, it's some of that work that I want to highlight here. So the question is, does phosphorus supply limit trichodesmium abundance and nitrogen fixation? And the system that we're looking at is the Western North Atlantic, also called the Sargasso Sea. And in this region, dissolved inorganic phosphorus, or DIP, is very low. And actually, the DOP, or the organic pool, is also very low. Yet we still have populations of this cyanobacteria. So here are some images of these colonies. They're really beautiful. They're actually macroscopic. You can see them with the naked eye. And there are cells that form these long filaments, and then these filaments organize into these colonies of different morphologies. And when we go out and we look for trichodesmium in the low phosphorus North Atlantic, we can find it. So here's a plot with depth over a cruise transect that we did from uh, roughly Bermuda to Barbados. And trichodesmium abundance is plotted there. This is work um, using a molecular tool to track trichodesmium that my postdoc, Monica Rocco, developed. And in fact, uh, under certain conditions, we can actually see a correlation between the phosphorus pools and the abundance of this organism. So this long gave us some interest into the fact that phosphorus was probably important to its growth and physiology. I just want to say a quick word about phosphorus in this system. I already mentioned the inorganic and organic pools. The inorganic pools are very low. So what you're looking at is depth profiles over the season. And the inorganic pool is basically pegged on the left there, right about zero. It's much smaller than the organic pool in black, which is quite a bit higher in the surface waters where trichodesmium occurs. Um, and part of the challenge for why we can't just measure phosphorus and use that to predict whether or not trichodesmium is going to have enough or not is because of this organic pool, we don't understand its bioavailability very well. In fact, it's largely a black box. We know the phosphorus comes in two main bond forms in this black box, one called an ester bond, which has got an oxygen in it, and one uh, phosphonate bond, which is just a carbon-phosphorus bond. And Actually, we know from genetic work that trichodesmium can use both of these forms of phosphorus, but we don't know if it can use every substrate in that pool because we're just looking at bond class. So my graduate student, Liz Orchard, and I set about trying to figure out how we could assay phosphorus supply in populations in this system. And the first, first thing we tried was actually with radioisotope tracers. So we would collect cells, spike them with uh, radioactivity phosphorus in different forms, and look what they take up. And this works OK, but there are some problems. First of all, we don't have good tracers for the organic pools. We only have one, and that's ATP. And it's not likely very representative of what organic pool they're actually seeing in the environment. And it turns out that um, we don't have any substrates that represent phosphonates that are radio-labeled. So we already knew we were sort of missing most of the pool. We also don't have a good way of linking it to nitrogen fixation. So I have to say, Liz, was you, when you're doing radioisotope work on a ship, you have to be in this little van. There's usually no windows. Usually the air conditioning is broken. And it's about 100 degrees in there. And um, on one of these cruises, we had to outrun a hurricane. And I think it was about that time when she said, Sonia, I really think we should come up with a better plan. I said, I think so. <laughs> she was really tired of doing that. And so we thought, surely we can use a molecular tool. The genome had just been sequenced. And we thought, look, if um, the transcription of one of these phosphorus-regulated genes is tighter to how much phosphorus is getting into the cell, 
then we could use that as a tool for predicting phosphorus supply to trichodesmium. And the gene we first decided to work on is called FOX. It encodes an enzyme called alkaline phosphatase, which hydrolyzes phosphorus from esters into phosphate that the cell can then use to grow. And we knew that the alkaline phosphatase gene was present, and we showed that both the gene and the enzyme activity are induced when you put the cells under low P. So on the right is just an enzyme activity assay where we can tag trichodesmium cells with a green color when they're making the enzyme. So the top panel is just the autofluorescence of the pigment, and the bottom is the green saying this enzyme is turned on. And so first as a cross check, we thought, well, we better make sure that the enzyme's turned on in the field, because it's, if it's not, then we're really, this isn't gonna be a good tool. So the first thing we did was take a colony and assay it, and you can see it lit up like a Christmas tree. So this colony was making lots of that enzyme in the Western North Atlantic. So we thought, well, okay, that's great, but now we need to get to the hard work of developing our tool. And we started in culture, and we grew them under various phosphorus supply rates. So a low supply rate at 10%, high rate at 25%. And this also relates to the growth rate. So they're growing much faster when you give them lots of phosphorus than they are when you're not giving them much phosphorus. And you can see the expression of the FOX gene in the graph there. And we get higher and higher expression the more starved for phosphorus they get. In fact, if we take those starved populations, the other thing we have to do is make sure that it will turn off if they're refed with phosphorus of different forms. And that's the experiment that you see here. So the control is a starved treatment where the gene is turned on. And then we basically spiked different phosphorus substrates into that culture, waited four hours to see if how quickly the genes would turn off. And we added one that we didn't think would be bioavailable and shouldn't have any effect on the signal, and that's phytic acid. And then we added three that should be bioavailable. And you can see in each case, the transcript went down. So the cells responding to the fact that it had phosphorus resupplied. So the next thing to do was to relate it to nitrogen fixation. So we did similar experiments, but this time we measured nitrogen fixation in those treatments. And you can see that nitrogen fixation is highest when you have lots of phosphorus and they're happy and growing well. And it gets lower when you're half starved for phosphorus. If you're hungry, you're not fixing as much nitrogen. And we actually can plot those, those two against each other and come up with a pattern like this, where we have gene expression relative to the percent reduction in maximal nitrogen fixation rate. So the more transcription we get of that signal, the more of a likely reduction in maximal nitrogen fixation rate we're gonna get. So we had our tool ready to go. We went out into the field, and we did a whole series of cruises, both in higher phosphorus environments as a control, like the South Pacific, and then back in our favorite low phosphorus place, the Western North Atlantic. So Liz and I went on all four of these cruises together, and uh, you can see the ship here. Oh, maybe not. It's that one. So. <laughs> So that's the research vessel um, Endeavor, and I have spent many months of my life on that ship. It's always a little demoralizing when you have to load next to the cruise ship um, because it is very small relative to a cruise ship. And the, the main tools we use, of course, are um, a CTD rosette to collect water, which is kind of in the back there, and nets to collect trico. It's pretty great to be able to actually fish for microbes. And of course, it looks like this in this beautiful weather all the time. I will say, this is not me, and this person was not hurt, so you don't need to worry about it. But um, we have both been out there in some pretty crazy weather. So he here we are sampling with the CTD to take our chemical measurements. And here I am actually deploying the net to collect the trichodesmium. So we actually tow the net through the water. It comes up with a little bucket on the end. And it actually looks like that. So I don't know if anyone can see, but these little sort of eyelash things in that bucket, that's trichodesmium. 
And what we do is we actually take a little mini turkey baster and we pick them out for our analyses. Mind you, we're picking them out like this, right, because the ship's moving. So it's really, it's really kind of a labor of love. You have to really love the trico picking. My graduate student, Kyle, just picked Trico for many months. He's in the back on a, on a recent expedition. So, um, You can see, actually, the two colony morphologies here. So on the left, those are the more rounded ones. And on the right are the more linear ones, which we call rafts. So we collect our colonies. We've gone through all of this. And then we have to go in and fish for the quantitative signal of that one transcript and plot it out over all of these ocean basins. And it's those data that you see here. So here I have the expression of our FOX. In this case, I plotted it versus the total dissolved phosphorus. But we've run the correlation against the inorganic pool as well. And you can see that there's a great correlation between phosphorus and the expression of this gene. And in fact, the it's a tighter relationship with the total phosphorus, which probably reflects the fact that the organic pool is, to a certain extent, bioavailable. The stars are just where our culture controls line up on that uh, extrapolation there. So you remember we had this, uh, oh, so sorry. So we have basically low phosphorus supply in the North Atlantic, where you can see our North Atlantic samples and higher phosphorus supply in the South Pacific. But we have that relationship with nitrogen fixation. And if we plot that over our graph, it looks like this. So all those samples in the Western North Atlantic actually fall into a region where we would expect a very large reduction in maximal nitrogen fixation rate. Now, it's always a little challenging to extrapolate from those culture samples to the field in this way, because there could be other things going on. But it's certainly very strongly suggestive of the fact that if you added phosphorus to the Western North Atlantic, you probably could support more nitrogen fixation. And these results actually corroborate very well with model studies that have predicted phosphorus being a limiting factor of nitrogen fixation in the Western North Atlantic. And what we're doing now is taking this a step further and saying, well, we don't have to just look at phosphorus signals, this one gene. We can look at many genes at one time. And in fact, we know the regulation patterns of other genes, not just FOX, but FUND, which is uh, involved in phosphonate metabolism. There's a gene called IDIA, which is regulated by iron. It would be an indication of iron stress. And then we can look at reference genes that we don't think should change and track all of them at once. And that's what we've been doing more recently. These are some samples from recent cruises, again, in the Western North Atlantic and in the Pacific near Hawaii. And the Pacific has much higher phosphorus and lower iron relative to the Atlantic. So we would expect phosphorus signals potentially in the Atlantic and iron signals in the Pacific. And so we take those samples, we put them through a pipeline, kind of similar to what we did with the diatoms. And uh, here I'm going to show you the data. So what I've done is color code the Atlantic blue and the Pacific orange. And here are the gene expression patterns. So our two phosphorus regulated genes are on the left. And you can see the blue is over the orange. So we're getting stronger signals in the North Atlantic, as we would expect. IDIA, which is iron regulated, and the higher it is, the more iron stress the populations are likely to be, is higher in, from the Pacific samples. And you can see that our RMPB, that reference gene, is actually not changing much between the two populations. So I think this is a, a first pass step. It's saying, look, we can develop these molecular tools to help us tell what's going on with the physiology and the biogeochemistry of this organism out in the field. So just to summarize, we found that the organic phosphorus pool was bioavailable. That phosphorus supply looked like it may limit nitrogen fixation in the western North Atlantic. And the predicted biogeochemical drivers of nitrogen fixation, i.e. iron and phosphorus, 
are reflected in the trichodesmian physiology when we look at those gene signals. So now we're at the last vignette, which is really thinking about, again, similar things. How do I respond to the environment as an organism, but more looking forward to the future ocean and what might happen as the ocean's changing. One of the big challenges in my microbial oceanography now is that we're making these measurements on a changing baseline. Things don't stay the same, and certainly not right now. So everything that we're learning and understanding may shift moving forward. And in fact, we expect pretty dramatic shifts over the next 100 years. So we expect increased temperature in the upper water column because of warming. We expect altered nutrient supply, largely decreases in things like nitrogen and phosphorus. It's a little unclear what will happen with iron. It largely depends on storms. You can see in that cartoon, they sort of have predicted larger dust storms maybe in the future. And then with increased CO2, we have an ocean acidification problem. And that is the ocean is getting more acidic the more CO2 you pump into it. So we have been doing a series of experiments where we basically mimic some of these conditions, the low nutrients, the high CO2, the changes in pH. And again, using similar pipelines and similar protocols, we look at if I grow a culture under high CO2 and a control, how does that change their transcription? How does that change physiology? How does that change growth rate and other activities? And in fact, what we're a part of is a collaborative study where we're actually trying to do these experiments long term. It's increasingly common to do them very short term. So I take a population and I shift it to high CO2 for a week or something and then I measure the response. And this is understandable. It's what we can do in the confines of funding and timing and whatnot. But really, it's not very realistic of what the organisms experience. And so what we're doing now is actually evolving in long-term lines some of these phytoplankton where every 100 generations, in some cases this is once a year, we'll take these populations, pull them back out, and do experiments on them and ask, have you changed? Have you evolved when you were growing under high CO2? And as I said, this is part of a collaborative study. Some of these experiments that we did on the short term, as well as others, we're using in simulations to try to make predictions about what we think will happen in terms of phytoplankton diversity. So um, this is a, a collaborative work with a colleague of mine named Stephanie Dukowitz, who's at MIT. And so all the modeling is really um, her purview. I want to make sure she gets credit for that. So, um, the idea is to use a global numerical ocean model to look at how low nutrient, elevated temperature, and elevated CO2 influence the distribution of six different functional groups of phytoplankton. So this is like nitrogen fixers versus diatoms, as well as different genetic types. So within the diatoms, she can assign different genetic types. Um, some of the model details are there. You don't really need to worry about it. Uh, so what it would look like is this. We have different functional groups. And in the case of temperature, each member within that functional group would be assigned a different peak temperature growth rate. And they're parameterized in that picture you see to the right. And you ask, if this is the dominant functional group now, what happens in year 2100? Um, oh, this is just some actual data of temperature optima showing you that we run these experiments and then use those data to populate the model. So if we look at the effect of temperature in 2000 versus 2100, you can see there are some shifts, but I can tell you right now it doesn't look quite as dramatic as what I'm going to show you in a minute. So we can do the same thing for the other parameters. This is some of our parameterization of CO2. So we actually pulled this data from the literature from 49 different studies where they had grown phytoplankton under high CO2. And the range of responses is shown there for the different functional groups. And the pattern of the growth rate is shown on the right. One caveat is that a lot of these studies are done with single 
increased CO2 level. So we only have end members, and we don't really know what function and shape those curves should take. And that's an important thing to think about that we're trying to address moving forward. So if we run the model, this is the output. So we have 2,000 up in the left. Then we have 2,100 with all parameters on the right. In the lower right, there's CO2 only. So that's the only thing that changed. And then on the bottom left is everything but CO2. So a couple things might strike you right away, and that is if you let everything change, it looks very similar to CO2 alone which is suggestive of the fact that CO2 has a large effect on the dominant functional group in this model. That is a great question. So um, we have a couple, but it is complicated to do that large factorial study, and there have been very few. So we do not have good information on the combined effects. And um, that's something that has really been called on the com in terms of the community. Everybody recognizes that that needs to be addressed. Um, the other thing that's striking about these plots is that you can see that Prochlorococcus, which is in green, is, is no longer the dominant in 2100, both in the CO2 only and in the all. So it's quite a striking response. Uh, this just summarizes what I just said, that there's a major shift in functional diversity, that CO2 is important relative to other changes. And one of the things that's subtle that you may not be picking up on is that the outcomes actually are, are heavily influenced by the responses of your competitors. So it matters not only what you will do, but what your major competitor does. And that was clear with the, the prochlorococcus result. And um, as we've already had questions, we need much more data for better predictive power. So, well, it depends on the study and how they did the experiment. You can manipulate CO2, and you can manipulate pH. It, it does do different things to the carbon chemistry. And um, we took studies that did, did both shifts in this, this compilation, I believe. So in summary, uh, future ocean conditions influence species both positively and negatively. That modeling of short-term responses suggests there could be major changes by, of the dominant functional group by 2100. But really, we need longer-term studies. We need more combined factorial studies, as well as response curve studies to better predict future changes. So what I hope I'm leaving you with today is that marine microbes exert profound control over how the ocean and our planet function. They're beautiful, exciting, and amazing. And that the physiological ecology of these populations, what they're doing, how they're interacting with their environment, are actually probably more complex than we previously appreciated, and that these new molecular level tools, particularly with transcriptomics, is shedding some important light on that. And all of these studies are going to be necessary moving forward if we want to understand how the ocean's going to function in the future. I have many people who have helped in the lab and been great colleagues over the years. And I'll just conclude, like all oceanographers do, with our favorite sunset shots. So I'd be happy to take uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, 